Amen. Today we're going to talk about the realm, and I had a I had a title called How It Works, but I'm actually going to change the title to The Realm, Open Our Ears and Open Our Eyes. We've been teaching about the realm of God or the kingdom of God, it's the same, same thing, and what we're doing is encouraging you to leave the world and the God of this world's way of thinking and instead, we want you to think like God and live in the realm of God or the kingdom of God. That's what, he, that's what we want. This is the world. We want you to start living in the kingdom of God because we are no longer in that kingdom, but we have to th- change the way we think in order to get there. If you, if you turn with me, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to be reading today out of the New Century Version. I like to use a different version now and then because I find myself, I get so familiar with the words in the version that I'm used to, they become almost like prayer beads. I just go through the motion and they don't really function for me the way they should. So I'm using the NCV because it gives you a different perspective. So the NCV says in verse, uh, in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 2, do not be shaped by this world. Aha, here we go. Do not be shaped by this world, but be changed by a new way of thinking. By a new way of thinking, then you will be able to decide what God wants for you. Listen to that. What God wants for you, and you will know what is good and pleasing to Him and what is perfect. Now, doesn't that this process of leaving the world and going over to the kingdom of God? Because being able to decide what He wants for you is having him to be your king and telling you what to do. He knows what he wants for you and decide to be able to know what is good and pleasing to him. Amen? Now note that this is a transformation in the way we think. And it's almost totally opposite. I'm telling you, it's almost totally opposite the way the world thinks. For example, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, which we've been talking about as a theme, we set our eyes not on what we see. We set our eyes not on what we see. We set our eyes on what we cannot see. What we see will only last a short time. What we can't see will last forever. That doesn't make any sense to the world, does it? But it does if you're a believer and you know what it is to believe God, and all of a sudden, as you believe, He manifests Himself in a way that you can't deny. The world says, see it to believe it. Faith says, I believe what I cannot see. Now, Jesus talked about a parable that was a key to understanding all parables. It's the parable of the sower. Now, Jesus talked about this seed being the Word of God. So if I've got my seed here, it's the Word of God that I'm spreading. I'm spreading the Word. And he tells us, this Word tells us how God thinks, but the parable also tells us about what can happen when we hear or read this word. He said that some seed fell on hard ground or the path and Satan came quickly and stole the seed. Have you ever gone to church 
and a few hours later, you can't remember what was taught at all? Maybe it happens every week to you. Can't remember a thing about the service. Could remember when you went shopping and what kind of deals you got or whether you went to the ball game and what plays were made. But to remember what actually happened in church, can't remember a thing. Hmm, I wonder what was happening. I wonder what was happening. It also says that some seed fell on rocky ground and sprang up immediately. And they received it with great joy. But they did not allow the teaching to go deep inside their lives. And when trouble came because of the word, they gave up. How many people give up? How many people give up church or their faith because of troubles? There's a lot. There's a lot. Some seed fell on ground that had thorns or weeds. It sprouted, but the thorns are described as, now listen, these are the thorns, the worries of this world. You magnify those. The temptations of wealth. The temptations of wealth and many other evil desires, and it kept the teaching from growing and producing fruit in their lives. So seed that's sown on that ground, it might sprout, but it doesn't produce any fruit because of these circumstances. Some seed fell on good ground and produced much fruit. The good ground is broken. Did you hear that? Broken. It's broken. And the seed goes deep into the soil. And there are no weeds to choke it. Ask a question. Anybody ever have a garden? You ever have a garden? Who did the weeding? Yeah. So I believe all this can happen, all these situations and circumstances that from the parable of the seed of the sower can happen in an individual's life. Sometimes certain seeds are stolen. Sometimes these seeds fall on rocky ground or ground with weeds, and some fall on good ground and produce fruit all within an individual's life. We may have certain things that work really well with us where other things don't work at all. Are you with me? So it all starts, brothers and sisters, with the way we think. There's the battleground right there. That's the battleground. For example, these are some of the thoughts that we should be thinking to function in the realm of God after we believe in Jesus as our Savior. So these are thoughts that are consistent with the realm of God and inconsistent with the world. The first one is that we died. Did you hear that? We, you, died in Christ. You died. And are born again as a new creation. You're a new creation. You were a wildebeest, and now you're a lion. It's that dramatic. It's that profound. It can't be reversed, I don't think. Now, the second thing is, and I want to say this with power, sin no longer has dominion over you. It doesn't. The Word of God says it. And it also says we should be thinking that way. Sin doesn't have dominion over you anymore. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. 
and instructed to give our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. You want to you wanna service God just reasonably? Give your body to him. You're not your own. We are in Christ right now. You're in Christ right now. And he is in us right now. Amen. Christ, listen to this, Christ is our life. Christ is our life. He is our life. And he wants to live his life through us. That's what he wants to do. It's not your life anymore. You, you gave it to him. You gave your body to him. And he wants to use it. I'm telling you, he wants to use it. Amen. Amen. We are adopted children of God. You're a child of God. And he is our spiritual father now. Satan is no longer your spiritual father. You were born again. I'm telling you, he's not. Our citizenship is in heaven, not here on earth. And... We are his ambassadors to this world. You're an ambassador. Yeah. You know what an ambassador does? It represents the government. What is the government? The kingdom of God. Amen. That's, what, that's who we are. We walk by faith in his ability to do what he promised. The faith is not in our faith. The faith is in he is able to do what he promised. Just read Romans chapter 4. We believe he's able to do what he promised. Amen. Now it's interesting if we, if we read 2 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, it says... Listen to this. Listen to this. We walk by faith in his ability to do what he promised. And Jesus said, Jesus has the power of God. Jesus has the power of God by which he has given us what? Everything we need to live and serve God. Oh, I need more. No. No. He's given you everything you need. And we have these things because we know him. Amen. We have these things because we know him. Jesus called us by his glory and goodness. By his glory and goodness. Not yours. Thank you, Jesus. My wife could explain that very clearly. It's not my goodness that made me a child of God. It's his. Through these he has given us the very great and precious promises. With these gifts we can share in God's nature. Did you hear that? You want to act like God? He's given you promises that by these you can be partakers of his divine nature. And the world will not ruin you with its evil desires. Amen. That's the promise of God. We need to be thinking like that. Gratitude for his great love and forgiveness should be our motivation. Not trying to please others, not trying to look good, not trying to build ourselves up, not being, you know, afraid of what somebody else thinks about me. No, I am motivated because I'm so grateful God forgave me all my sin. 
How can I hold anything against anybody else? It says, great faith starts by recognizing your total unworthiness. Great faith recognizes you have nothing to offer God. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Is that like the world? No, it's totally different. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. That's not like the world. Love your enemies. You want to be a leader? Become the servant or slave to all. That's not like the world. The first shall be last, and the last first. That's, that's about God. Little is much in the kingdom of God. You get in the kingdom by giving. You get by giving. You are chosen and called individually and have supernatural gifts to fulfill your calling. Is that the way you're thinking? That's a promise. That's a promise. So there are many others. I could go on and on, but all this seed from the world and the question is, what kind of ground? All this seed is from God, rather. The question is, what kind of ground is this seed falling on? Huh? What kind of ground is it falling on? Let us look at a few scriptures to observe how Jesus worked with his disciples to teach and train them to think and act in ways that would enable them to function in the realm of God. Now, teaching, you remember, is like getting information. It's getting knowledge about the Word. We're explaining things about the Word. Training is not the same. Training is repetitive experiences when you go through over and over and over again, because we're not that bright sometimes, that that training makes it real in our lives. When I'm raising Teddy, I'm teaching him and I'm training him. And training is every day going over the same thing. Every day he asks the same questions. Every day we have the same answer. And it seems like it's overwhelming at times, but I'm telling you, I've raised about six kids. You stay at it. And when they get old, they will not depart from those ways. I'm telling you, it's true. I've seen it happen. So, please turn with me to Mark chapter 6, because we're going to spend most of our time today in Mark. So get over to Mark chapter 6. And I would like to look at three situations where Jesus is teaching his disciples to renew their minds or start thinking like they're living in God's realm instead of the world. So we're going to look at three situations where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to think like the world and not think like God. Okay. We're going to be looking first at the feeding of 5,000. But before this, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. Remember, he sent out his disciples two by two and gave them his authority. And it says in Mark chapter 6, we'll start in verse 12. So the followers went out and preached that people should change their hearts and lives. Now that's an interesting way to paraphrase. Repent. Change your heart and your lives. They forced. They didn't ask. They forced many demons out and put 
olive oil on many sick people and healed them. Hmm. Jesus gave them authority. They went out and they said to demons, Oh, please go. God, would you come down and take this demon out? No. They said, In the name of Jesus, be gone. They forced them out by his authority. And they put oil on people who were sick and they recovered. And they came back. And they were excited and started to share. But there were so many people around, the Bible says, they could not eat. So Jesus said, come away by yourselves. We will go to a lonely place to get some rest. I'm just telling you, rest is important. You can work yourself and get tired. I'm telling you by experience, the thing that undermines your faith as much as anything, is you're just tired. Just tired. You get a good night's rest, things look totally different. If you're tired and discouraged, and it's not a good time to make any decisions. Get some rest. Jesus did it. So they got into a boat and went to a lonely place. But the people saw them leave and ran around And we're waiting for them, a multitude. The Bible says over 5,000 people made that trip, running around the lake, going to that lonely place. And that didn't include women and children. And Jesus had compassion on them and began to teach. Now, the Scripture does not tell us what he taught, but I believe it was something like what he said when he first started his earthly ministry. That was after his baptism by John the Baptist and after he was tempted in the wilderness by the enemy. Forty days he fasted. And then it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, you don't have to go there, just look up. He said, this is Jesus said, the right time has come. And I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, the right time is now. The right time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Change your hearts and lives and believe the good news. Most people think repent means stop sinning. But I'm telling you, it means change your heart and lives. Change the way you think. That's what this is about. And believe the gospel, the good news. Jesus solves it all. (coughs) Sounds like what he told the disciples to preach, doesn't it? Isn't that what he told the disciples? When he sent them out. And it's the same for us, basically. The kingdom of God is here. It's a good time. The time is now. Believe. Change your heart. Change your mind. Change your life. And believe in Jesus. It got late in the day, and the disciples came to Jesus, and you can just imagine this. Here are all these people out there. It's getting late in the afternoon. The disciples says, you know, we've been, we've been thinking, Jesus. <clears throat> we know that there's a lot of people out here, and... They're tired, and there's no grocery stores for them to go to. And what we think, and we think this is a really good idea, we think you should send them away so they can find some food. That's good worldly thinking, isn't it? But what did Jesus say? Verse 37. He said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Oh, what have we been saying? When Jesus tells us to do something, he always gives us the ability and authority to accomplish it. But it requires believing 
or faith. When he said, you give them something to eat, all of a sudden, they were authorized and empowered to do it. Can you hear me? How did the disciples respond? <clears throat> it says, they said to him, we would have to work a month to earn enough money to buy that much bread. Thinking like the world. And Jesus said, verse 38, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go and see. How many loaves of bread? What do you have? What are you bringing to the table? I've given you authority. What are you going to bring? Well, we've got five loaves and two fish. So it says that Jesus had the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100, and he took the bread and blessed it. Oh, that blesses me. He took the bread from the world, he blessed it, and changed it into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, he changed it into the kingdom of God. Now all of a sudden, that bread will function whatever way the kingdom wants it to function. Amen? I think praying over your food is really important. I do it most of the time. And when I don't do it, my wife reminds me. I think it makes a big difference. I think, I think that we can move things out of this world into the kingdom. So he blessed it and then divided it and gave it to the disciples to give to the people. Did you hear that? He divided it and gave it to the disciples to give to the people. Now, I don't believe that he created a mountain of food that the disciples had to haul out to 5,000 men, not including women and children. I did some calculation and found that each person could eat about 12 ounces of fish and bread. That translates to over two tons of food or a little more for a little more than 5,000 people. And if there were as many women and children, that would be four tons of food. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of food. That's a big pile of food. Amen? Amen. That would be about 350 pounds per disciple to take out to seven locations or of the groups of 50 and 100 at a minimum. Could be double that because it's 5,000 men, not including women and children. Here's what I believe. I can't prove it, but this is just what I think. I believe he divided it into 12 baskets, divided the food into 12 baskets, gave the baskets to the disciples, and then they started handing it out. But the baskets never ran out of food. Never ran out of food. The food multiplied in the hands of the disciples, I believe. But either way, the disciples fed the people. You see, when Jesus tells us to do something, if we refuse, it does not change our responsibility. When he tells us to do something, it doesn't change our responsibility. But in this case, and in all cases, he co-labors. Listen to me. He co-labors with them and us to accomplish his purpose, the kingdom purpose. In this case, feeding 5,000 men, not including women and children. So let me ask you this question. How many baskets of food were left over? Twelve. Good, good. So now... Mark chapter 6, verse 45, it says that Jesus immediately, after they got through, Jesus immediately told his disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida across the lake. 
He stayed there to send the people away, and after sending them away, he went up into the mountain to pray. And we know the story. We, we remember the story. It got dark. A storm came up. The disciples were about to drown in the storm, and they were overwhelmed with fear. But Jesus saw their need. Now, he's three or four miles away. He's on the mountain, and it's dark. So he has supernatural revelation or word of knowledge or whatever it was that those disciples were hurting. So he goes down, and what does he do? Do, 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 right across the top of the water. And it says he, he walked to them. I don't know, maybe he was translated. I, I don't know, but he was three or four miles out. So that would take an ordinary person to walk about an hour over the water. This wasn't just a, you know, I'm here to the wall. They were out there. So he walked on the water <clears throat> three or four miles, and then they think, when they see him, that he's a ghost. Oh, and so they're not only just mortally afraid of drowning, they think there's a ghost. So they're just overwhelmed with everything. And then, but Jesus said to them, look at the, look at the verse, Jesus said to them, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid, Thinking. What are you thinking? Don't be afraid. And then he got into the boat with them. And the wind died down and became calm. And the followers were greatly amazed. Wow. Wow. I want to tell you a little secret. Jesus is in the boat with you. He's in the boat with you right now. And he's saying, I'm telling you, he's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You trust me, the storm will come. But now look at verse 52. This is very interesting. They, the disciples, did not understand about the miracle of the five loaves because their minds were closed. Who, who, what? Why is the miracle of the five loaves revel relevant to this situation? What's going on there? What should they have learned that could have helped them overcome the storm and the wind and the waves and their fear and their anxiety and all their trembling. What's going on here? Well, I say it's the same thing that they were so excited about when he sent them out two by two and gave them his authority to cast out demons and heal the sick. When he tells you to do something, he gives you the authority to do it. He told the disciples to go to the other side, didn't he? Whew. He told them to go to the other side. When he tells you to do something, he gives you the ability to do it. He told the disciples to feed the 5,000 and then co-labored with them to accomplish it. He co-labored. What did Jesus tell the disciples to do? To go to the other side. They had the power and authority to go to the other side. They could have not let their minds run wild with what might happen. Have you ever been in that place? Your mind just goes crazy. I wonder if the enemy actually helps that go. I wonder. I've, I've experienced it. I remember I was gonna, I was gonna lose my house because I couldn't, couldn't pay the bills. And man, I'm thinking about losing my business and all these. I would get cold sweats. 
It was all untrue. God delivered me. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So they could have believed that Jesus would work with what little they had. Remember, little is big in the kingdom. He works with whatever you got. How many? Five loaves and two fishes? That's enough. He works with what little you have to accomplish his purpose. And they could have spoken to the wind and the waves like they did to the demons. I'm telling you, they could have. They could have done it. But they did not. Why? The Bible says their minds were closed. If God is not working through us like we know he could, could that be our problem? I think so. I think so. And I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to me too. Turn with me. Because we're not through with the feeding of 5,000 yet. Turn with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, it starts out with the miracle of feeding 4,000. Now this is, I think, we're still within the same year, if you, if you trust the chronology of the Bible experts. All this happened in the third year of his ministry. So he fed the 5,000. Now within the year, he's feeding 4,000. And Jesus takes seven loaves this time and a few fish and breaks it up and again gives it to the disciples to give to the people. Now the disciples are still thinking the same way. Now listen to what they said. Jesus' followers, this will be the disciples. Jesus' followers says, How can we get enough bread to feed all these people? We are far away from any town." What? You just saw what happened? Why are you thinking that way? How many of us have had God move in our lives in some powerful or supernatural way only to have the same fear and doubt when the same situation confronts us again? I have... Same situation, I still have the same fears and doubts. Same thing the disciples do. That's not right, brothers. Then the disciples, are the, this is after he fed the 5,000. And now the, Jesus is leaving. They're leaving the place where he fed the 5,000. And then the Pharisees came to Jesus looking for a miracle as a sign from God. So here are, the, here are the Pharisees, the worldly people. They want, hey Jesus, do a miracle for us because we want to know you're really from God. Was that based on faith? No, they're looking, for, they're looking to see something. Is that where faith comes from? No. It comes from believing something. So, he says to them <clears throat> when they got into the boat, uh, because Jesus refused to do that, that miracle and just left them on the shore. And then it says in verse 14, his followers, when they got to the boat, they only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. They had forgotten to bring more. And then Jesus said to them in verse 15, Be careful. Beware, that's two warnings, must be important. Be careful, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Now Jesus, having just encountered the Pharisees, is warning the disciples about something that can be very dangerous to them. He called it yeast, or leaven, and which is a 
a natural process that he's going to use to explain a spiritual principle. It's sort of like all parables. He uses a natural process to explain a spiritual reality. Now yeast, as anybody knows who bakes, is a living organism that is used to make bread rise and creates all those little holes in the bread. It just takes a little and it will spread through all the bread dough. And it can't be really stopped. It's very hard to stop it. This can be described as a good thing as it was in Matthew 13, 33. But here it is definitely negative. As it is in most places mentioned in scripture. We are not told the meaning of the yeast or leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. We don't know what that is, really. But I think it has to do with the way the religious system, the Pharisees, and the worldly system, Herod, work. I think it has to do with the worldly realm because they were in the worldly realm. They weren't in the kingdom of God. They both did not believe in Jesus. Neither one of them. And they both went to see, they wanted to see to believe. Now, I did a lot of study on this yeast of the Pharisees and the scribes. And there's all kinds of theories about it, but I don't really have time to get into that. I'm just boiling it down to, I think, what are the essentials. The yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod appears to be the misunderstanding or even unbelief of the disciples. And Jesus is saying, that misunderstanding that you have and that unbelief can be very dangerous to you. Now let's see how the disciples responded to what he said, this warning that he said. And his, default, and his followers discussed in verse 16 the meaning of that saying. And they said, he said, this is because we have no bread. So the disciples, hearing this warning, realizing that they didn't bring any bread, they're thinking, oh, Jesus is putting on the spot because we didn't bring any bread. They just saw the feeding of the 4,000. They saw the feeding of the 5,000 earlier. But what are they doing? They're thinking like we do too often. They weren't thinking like the kingdom. They were thinking like the world. Verse 17, Jesus says, Knowing that they were, what they were talking about, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about not having bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your minds closed? Have you eyes, but you do not really see? You have ears, but you do not really listen? Remember when I divided five loaves of bread for the 5,000? And how many baskets did you fill with the leftovers? And the people said, how many? Twelve. And then he said, I, and then when I divided the seven loaves of bread for the 4,000, how many baskets did you fill with the leftover pieces of food? Seven. And then Jesus said to them, don't you understand yet? Oh, loving Jesus, he's always so nice. Don't you understand yet? Now, I want, to, I want to just back up a second. This is a good example of math in the kingdom of God. We start out with five loaves and end up with 12 baskets after feeding 5,000 people. We start out with seven loaves, more food, 
And we end up with seven baskets full, and we fed 4,000 men and women plus children. Well, probably more than that. What's the point? When you start with less in the kingdom, you end up with more. Start with less, you end up with more. Why? Because you're trusting God instead of yourself. You're trusting God. Jesus asked some piercing questions. Having seen those miracles, why are you concerned with what you do not have? Having seen the miracles of the bread, why are the disciples still thinking in a worldly way and concerned because Jesus is upset with them because they only brought one loaf of bread? Why do you start out thinking about what you don't have? Shouldn't we be thinking about magnifying the Lord? What does he say? Bring what you got. Give me what you got. I'll make it work. Amen. I'll make it work. It's because we think like the world way too much. How many have seen God work in a powerful and supernatural way to provide what we need or heal us only to fall into the same doubts and fears when we face a similar trial down the road. I've done it myself. In fact, it's, morally, it's probably more common than it is uncommon that we do that same thing. We look at the disciples and wonder how could they have been so dense to respond the same way after they had participated in feeding 5,000 before? We could ask ourselves the same question. Why are you talking about what you do not have? Do you still not see or understand? Are your minds closed? Have your, you have eyes, but you do not really see. You have ears, but you do not really listen. And then he said, remember? And he took them through the 5,000 and feeding of the 4,000. I believe God wants us to remember those times when he worked in our lives. Meditate on them. Incorporate them into how you think. He was doing that with the disciples. Don't you remember this? Don't you remember that? We do the same thing. We forget. He wants us to go back and remember those times when he moved in our lives in powerful ways, meditate on it, think about it, pray about it, ask God to give you insight in how to make this part of me. Go from here to here. Remember those times that God gave to you. That's very, very important. It can be how God starts to renew your mind. I'm telling you. Now, I believe God wants to remember those times, meditate them, incorporate them, how we thinking. He was doing that with the disciples. Now the question is, do you see and not understand? Go back. Remember all those things. Pray about it. Ask God to help you. That's key in this whole process. Ask God to help you. Are your minds closed? I tell you, a lot of us have closed minds. You might be open in some areas, but you're closed in others. 
God wants you to open your mind up. God wants to work in you to accomplish all those promises that he's given us. Exceeding great and precious promises that by those you can partake in the divine nature. Why? Because you're born again. Because sin has no dominion over you. Because you are in Christ. You died with Him. You were buried with Him. You were raised with Him. You ascended with Him. And you are sitting in heavenly places right now. Open your mind. Repent. And ask God to help you. You have eyes, but you're not really seeing. Look at yourself. Be honest with yourself. Ask God to open your eyes. Ask Him. You have ears, but you don't really listen. The enemy comes in and steals it. Whew! That was a good message. That was a good message. Five hours later, I'm wondering, what was that message today? The enemy stole it. He's, he's hyperactive in that area. All right. Now, ask God to help you listen to what, has already, what he's already taught you and the way he's moved in your life. Start using those past experiences. Remember, you are his child, and he loves you, and he wants to live his life through you. I don't care what's past. He doesn't care what's past. Forgetting those things that lie behind and pressing on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ. That should be our mindset. But be extremely cautious of allowing the yeast of unbelief in your thoughts. I'm telling you, unbelief will spread throughout the whole lump of dough or your life. Jesus said, beware. Beware. Unbelief. The same thing can happen with fear. You can be dominated by fear in your life. You can be dominated by bitterness that creates a root that goes deep inside. And the Bible says that many are defiled. It's like a yeast. Anger. Unforgiveness in your thoughts. It's all like yeast. A little will infect everything. Beware. But, believe you are good ground. Start believing you're good ground. I'm good ground. Start proclaiming that. Start saying it. What is that? Faith. It's believing what you don't see. I'm good ground. Why? Because God said it. You're his child. He's called you. He's gifted you. He's given you these promises. You're good ground. Start believing it. Ask God to help you to live in the realm of God. Amen? Amen.